Well, welcome to uh, Spring Turkey Hunting How-To Seminar. Uh, I'm Carter Heath, uh, President of the Capital Region Strutters, National Wild Turkey Federation here in Concord, also the State Chapter President, uh, Board of Directors. Fred Bird, Regional Director. Um, so, uh, just a little bit about me. I've been turkey hunting for 30-plus years. Uh, really fell in love with it the last probably 12 years really taken a little more seriously uh, and it is an addiction it's a lot of fun and that's why I do it um, I've got the support of my awesome and lovely wife in the background <laughs> just as uh, she's pretty awesome so like Har said I'm Fred Bird I'm the regional director for the National Wild Turkey Federation here in uh, the New England states I do call New Hampshire my home I have I have since uh, the mid 80s so I am a resident for a long time here and it's been a great pleasure to see the wild turkey come from nil to well over 40,000 birds. And the 40,000 bird estimate is pretty conservative here. Um, what we're going to go over tonight is really kind of up to your participation and what your skill set is. So right now, let's just start off. Who, uh, who has never turkey hunted here before and this is going to be their first year? All right. All right. Who's been at it for some time? And when I say sometime, we're talking five years or better. Okay. I'm going. I'm going on my 17th year, something like that. So um, I was a late bloomer, if you will. I, I took. It took me a while to get started in it. I grew up fishing in New Hampshire, uh, but hunting never. It was, I wasn't raised in it. So my point being is, you're never too late to start. And some of y'all are going to prove that here in uh, spring 2018. So welcome, and I hope y'all take whatever you hear tonight, take it to the field, be successful with it, but continue on. In your hunting career, buy that license every year, uh, get involved with a conservation organization like the NWTF, Personal Club, and uh, stay involved. Our hunter numbers are, they're down. It's starting to dwindle. Um, we have a generation of, of hunters on the 60 to 80 year old demographic that they are either uh, had enough of it, or too old, or biology simply taken over and they no longer take oxygen in. And we are not replacing these people. So the fact that we have a good turnout here tonight, you guys uh, in that between 20 and 40 or mid 40 demographic are, are key to keeping this whole thing going so that we can have evenings like this and talk about turkey hunting 101 uh, because if we don't have hunters and we don't have hunter participation, we're not going to have it. There will be no seasons. We have this in New Hampshire as a privilege. It's not a right uh, according to our state constitution. So. Everything we go over tonight, we ask you to, to uh, take it into the field and be ambassadors uh, of what we do, of our hunting heritage. Because whatever you're putting out on social media, whatever you're doing on the side of the road, whatever you do in the field, directly reflects and represents a lot of us. And uh, where roughly 80% of the population doesn't participate and doesn't really have an opinion form one way or another about what we do, it can be sullied real quick. So just keep that in mind as we're going. It's going to be a fun night, a lot of information. I encourage uh, folks to ask questions. So yeah, definitely questions. Fair amount of folks that haven't. So we're going to kind of we're not going to dumb it down too much, but we are going to kind of start at the beginning, circa uh, 1850s, 1857. Uh, New Hampshire about had no turkeys, no wild turkeys, and uh, that, that kind of went across North America. Market hunting was big uh, about the turn of the last century. You had folks like Teddy Roosevelt and uh, modern day conservationist Aldo, Aldo Leopold. Folks like that, that that recognized market hunting was not a good thing. Unregulated hunting uh, was a detriment to our uh, our natural resources, our environment, and so your your modern day North American model of conservation was kind of instituted. That whole <coughs> idea is very very new in the last 50 years. That term. So um, you know we're kind of in this golden age, this heyday of, of being able to go out and participate in conservation, to participate in the hunting uh, seasons, especially when it comes to, to turkeys. So mid-70s, uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game, they started uh, trapping birds from uh, Allegheny State Park, uh, New York, Pennsylvania border. We traded them some fisher. Now I think we need some fisher back, right? Um, but there was this little uh, animal trade, and we got some birds that they reintroduced. And since then, that first 20, 25 birds uh, is now you know 40,000 plus birds that you're seeing from Coas County all the way down to Hampton Beach and parts in between and out towards Vermont and um, certainly the Connecticut River Valley was a big start for it and we'll get into that why that was a big uh, take uh, for habitat reasons. 
but um, you know, you're even finding the suburban areas in Manchester. So really, there's a whole lot of opportunity out here with over 100 wildlife management areas for you to go out and recreate on and play on that are open and available to you as licensed hunters and non-hunters alike. Uh, we encourage you to take advantage of those. So brief history there. So now let's go over our, our habitat and where we're going to start looking for these turkeys. Well, coming into spring, how many people have seen turkeys so far this spring? All right. How many have seen them strutting? Ah, good. Breeding? Um, you've yes. seen the breeding. Yes. Yep, good. good. Um, so what I've noticed is so far they're not really, they haven't been breaking up from their winter flocks a lot. Uh, the fields, because of the awesome winter weather we've been having, they haven't started to green up as much as they normally would. So. Uh, you're seeing a lot more roadkill turkeys because the spots that are greening up first are kind of along the roads. Turkeys are coming out, picking up grit for their craw, and uh, getting hit. Um, they've, they've been in the mast crop. We had a very good acorn crop this past year, acorns and beaches. And uh, I found in my, I'm a surveyor by trade, so I'm out in the woods a lot, so I pay attention to as much as I possibly can. Seen a lot of turkey scratching in the oaks all through the winter, which is which has been a really good thing for them. Uh, we we're just saying we're thinking there's going to be some some pretty big body sized turkeys mm -hmm. this spring. So, um, swamp edges, seeps, uh, places that'll green up first are uh, really quite popular. As as we get into the spring, dandelions, fields with uh, with grasshoppers. Uh, in, and you kind of want to hunt right coming into it where the hens are going to be because that's where the toms are going to want to be as well. It's, you know, that's the whole point of this uh, is, is kind of, we'll get into this, having that tom convinced that you are a sexy enough hen for him to go against his built-in hardwired nature to come to you. Mm -hmm. so, um, Four important keys here. Uh, for any wildlife, but you know, considering our turkeys for tonight, four things essential that every critter needs. Can you guys rattle them off real quick? Anybody know? Habitat. Habitat. Water. Water. Food. Food. One more. Women. <laughs> <laughs> well, this might this might work for you. Maybe space. Maybe they go together. I'm not sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Food, water, shelter, and space. Every critter needs that. So. Turkeys are kind of an interesting dichotomy in that they can have all those things in downtown Manchester and still right. survive when we can't hunt them there. <laughs> but keep that in the back of your mind uh, as, you're, as you're scouting, and uh, that goes for any other critter that you decide to pursue here in New Hampshire. Um, it's, it's looking like this spring, I'm, I'm hoping, and we've kind of discussed this as well, by the time this this weather pattern changes and we come into May, uh, it, it could see a pretty good upswell in gobbling and excited birds and, and everything. I know right now a lot of the areas that I typically find turkeys in this time of year, and they're not quite there yet. And uh, I'm not panicking, so if, if in your scouting, and I would encourage you all to uh, get out and scout based on what, what Fred is saying, you know, finding the food, the, the ridges, the hardwood ridges, um, uh, and then also roost areas is something I just want to say <coughs> real quick. Everybody knows turkeys fly up to roost every night. <coughs> it's just one of those things some people know, some people don't know. Some I've spoken to many people that didn't even know turkeys could fly. So they are a pretty strong flyer. Um, 55 miles 55 an hour. 55 miles an hour. We want to race one. Um, Get up to great heights as well, 75 yeah. foot. Yeah. So, lines. so you want to find these these roost spots, uh, and by that you'll you'll look for like the full large trees, and you'll look for droppings. Droppings on the ground around it. Because you found a whole pile of turkey turds. You found um, you found where you want to be set up. <coughs> right. So uh, large oaks, big bull pines, uh, usually up high on a ridge. When a tom is up, he wants to gobble. He wants everybody. Bring this up real quick. We're going to get into equipment, but while Carter's talking about scouting, um, 
Onyx Hunt is a fantastic app. Uh, not only is it great satellite that's up to date, but it gives the tax maps so you know who owns what land. We have a great. How do you spell that? Say again, sir. How do you spell that? O N X Onyx. You can see it right there. Onyx map. Onyx Hunt. Download that. So. Even though we have a great tradition of colonial land sharing here in New England where if it's not posted and where legally you can go play on it, you can still be neighborly. Go find out who owns these parcels of land, knock on the door and introduce yourself. We have gotten away from that in our society. Uh, I think, and I know Carter will agree, as people in the hunting community, if you are just decent enough and friendly enough to go shake a person's hand and introduce yourself, you're going to get along so well with your landowners. And it's, again, it reflects directly on our community as a whole. And you know, it only takes a couple bad apples kind of thing to cliche to spoil the bunch. A whole lot of us are, are great people. There are a lot of down to earth people, salt of the earth, and we want to know our neighbors, we want to know our landowners, and, and landowners want to know you guys as well. So, uh, on X, uh, what's another one I use? Uh, I use Hunt Stand. Hunt Stand's another great one. That's, I use that for surveying. That's yeah. free, but again, it's going to give you all your boundaries and let you know at least points of contact. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, so anyway, just back to the, the roost, um, typically the way I like to hunt, I like to know where they're roosting um, because then you can set up strategically near that spot and get as close as you dare knowing what the, uh, the terrain is, knowing what the, the woodsmanship component is really important. Um, you know, we've always said that turkey hunting is like 60% woodsmanship, 30% um, calling, and 10% luck. Maybe it's the other way around. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, having that roost tree, roost area is kind of, that's gold right there. Once you know where that is, you can set up adjacent. They're going to gobble off the roost. Then you're going to get to hear all the, the turkey talk, uh, which we'll, we'll go over. Uh, and they do have a language. They speak. They don't just make random gibberish. They have everything that they do and, and say has meaning. And uh, that's all cadence, volume, uh, excitement level. It's all conveyed in the calling. So as a turkey hunter, if you just go out first thing in the morning and just start yap, 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 just as fast and loud as you can, you may get them to gobble. Are you saying anything intelligible that, you know, and, and we'll go over that uh, as well. When scouting, too, it's also important to come back to the, 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 the apps we talked about, or even uh, Google Maps, it's free satellite. You find a great roosting spot, that's all good, but make sure you're legal. Mm -hmm. Make sure when you're looking at that big stand of white pine or their hemlocks or whatever it is, that on the other side of that hill, there's not a house, right? Because we got to be... 300 feet away from a house, 15 feet off a, a main class one road. So I've gotten into plenty of situations where I was like, oh, there's a struck zone, birds are there, and I'm, as I look at it, I'm legal. But literally right behind me across the road, because I put the horse blinder on, there's a house. Right. And I'm not, I'm within 100 feet of that house. And you get, you get birdie, right? It was like bird dog. Right. And you focus on that area. So I'm going to come back, I'm going to hunt that. But you can't because what's behind you is, is going to hinder that. So make sure you're just paying attention. Right. Make sure you see what's around you. We don't want anyone getting in trouble. Right. Yeah, you don't want to be getting an unnecessary violation for something like that. You don't want to so end up on simple. Northwood's law. Right, law. yeah. <laughs> no thanks. Mm -hmm. So, um, anything else on um, kind of scouting? Once you've found your spot and you identify where you want to go, and please, now is definitely the time. Don't expect to go out there May 2nd, you know, night of, and go out there May 3rd and then go kicking the stones. Saying, I couldn't find a turkey, there's no turkey. I mean, it takes some time. You've got to put some time into it. Um, as you go with your new folks, as you get through your, your turkey hunting career, you will start to get to know the areas where they're at. And, you know, it, it's all part of your experience. All this is all about you and how you want to experience. So if you want to go out and roost, go out and roost. Um, and by what I mean by roosting is literally putting them to bed, watching them fly up into the roost so that you've identified a bird, you come out the next day and hunt. I don't. Because I just know my spots. I have certain land that I hunt, and there every year birds show up, and and I, I just I have that luxury, so I'm, I'm intimate with the land I hunt. Um, but get out there now and, and experience it. So you've identified your spot. So identify a spot where you're gonna sit. 
So it's all good to have a spot where the turkeys are hanging out, but where are you going to set up and then be intimate with that spot? If you have to go in now, start moving deadfalls around, start moving rocks, or just having yourself comfortable because what we're going to talk about is, you know, the senses of these birds is incredible, especially their eyesight. So if you're in there wiggling around because you're not comfortable, it's going to bust your hunt nine times out of ten. You, there's not much you can get away from. If a turkey's in your line of sight, you've already been in its line of sight for a while. Right. Right. You know, their, their vision is, is amazing. It's ten times uh, better than ours. And their vision is they, they can almost get a 360 view. <coughs> just by a small turn of the head. So they're, they're very, very keyed into their environment. Everything likes a turkey dinner. Everybody loves, Everybody loves a turkey dinner. So These guys see in color yeah. as well. Right. And we'll talk about the different colors in the turkey's head and what that all communicates as well. But when it comes to your choice of, uh, let's just roll right into the equipment at this yeah. point. Um, your camouflage selection. Um, Carver's got a great pattern on. That's our uh, obsession, Mossy Oak, uh, NWTF. Yeah, we'll give our plug again. But uh, it's a great uh, pattern once we start leafing out. This time of year, you know, look outside. It's pretty brown and gray. So nothing says you can't wear something like that. But certainly we like to mix it up. So you're not going to, I wouldn't go out and, you know, first week of May with that on top, that on bottom, that on my head, that on my face and my hands because you're going to look like a, a, a lime out there. In the middle of the, so diversify with different browns and different colors, uh, but you you got to be cognizant of that the birds to see in color. Um, so you don't want to be out there like the whitetail was with a bunch of orange on. Now I would have some orange with you so that if you are successful on the pack out, you can put your orange on and be safe and let other hunters know you're there. Uh, but this is a this is a stealth mode deal and you want to be hidden. So head to toe, Stay cover full. up gloves. And face masks are very important because the movement of fingers or face, little shiny face moving around, will key them to your presence quickly. Um, speaking of clothes, one thing I like to do is I like to layer my camo, especially early in the season mm -hmm. like this, because you're going to have days when it's 38 degrees when you're starting out and 75 degrees around 11 o'clock in the morning. So I like to have something light that's still camo underneath and then kind of have a, a little heavier <coughs> top layer on that can be taken off, thrown into a pack. Um, and keeping with the, 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 theme, the theme of this is all about you, this is your experience. As far as I know, none of y'all have a contract with Outdoor Channel Sports Machine on Pursuit and otherwise, right? So keep it about you. Having this is, there's no competition here. So do make this about you in keeping that, your personal economy comes into a lot of this. So you're going to see a lot of cool gear here tonight, stuff that we've acquired over many years of, of hunting. Um, you know, it, don't put yourself in a hawk to kill turkeys. Right. There's plenty of good stuff that's very affordable, especially if you're just starting out. Um, and then you just build on that every year. Right. Yeah, you don't, you don't need all of this, Pick this that stuff. What's that? I said it, can, it starts oh, yeah. to add up. Yeah. So, um, that being said, though, I'm just going to go over a vest. Not necessary, creature comfort, but it does help having a system. And whether you have a vest or whether you have a coat or fanny pack, or fanny pack whatever, my encouragement is to have a system. Know where everything is so that. You're not fumbling pre-dawn, getting stuff ready and not knowing where your call is, not knowing where your uh, gloves and face mask. You know, this may look a little, a little much, but it's got everything that I want to carry, um, and it's it's my system. So. Uh, Test this stuff out well in advance. Yeah. Don't show up May third. You know, it's like a pair of boots, hunting boots. You want to wear them a few weeks before and you break them in. Otherwise, you're going to have some troubles. Another thing that's not necessary, again, a creature comfort is a rangefinder. The nice thing about that is if you are in question from a house, you can zap that distance and know, and then give yourself some for you know, being 300 plus feet away. 
Uh, another Cox. nice, the hot stand app that yeah, I talked about earlier will also get you close. It puts a 100 yard radius circle around from where you are roughly, so that's a good way to right. indicate But that don't well. base your, right. your license on that. That's right. You know, if you see that 100 yard circle, get plenty away, get plenty away from it. So stay, stay good and legal. Um, and then another nice thing I like to do with this is if I move, set up in a new spot, sit down, I'll just hit three trees and then I'll know, okay, that's 35, that's 30, that's 25. So I'll have kind of a radius so that when the big boy comes struck on in, I'm, you know, knowing where my effective range is. Your, your range finder has been vitally important for you archer hunters. Some people just like to straight bow hunt everything and that's cool. So you owe it to that animal to know your exact ranges so you can put a clean ethical kill on them. We don't need any peg leg turkeys running around the New Hampshire woods. Right. Um, another thing, I'm not affiliated or anything, but anybody that's ever used a thermocell, these things are awesome. Mm -hmm. It's worth the 24 bucks or whatever at Bass Pro just to have it. You use it all year round after you're done turkey yeah. hunting, put it on your porch and barbecue and right. some drinks. And Basically what that is, is like a little uh, barbecue grill sparker almost, a little butane cartridge. You screw it in, click it, and it heats up this element and there's a pad right on top of that that emits um, something that mosquitoes and black flies find it pretty pretty disgusting. It doesn't smell that bad to me. So. Scent is not an issue. This is more for right. you guys. Non-issue for turkey. So if someone tries to sell you turkey scent, <coughs> it's out there. I've seen it go away from the money yeah. line. Put it towards the thermostat. All right. I'll um, make a mock scrape, turkey mock scrape. A good set of optics can can make the difference between seeing a black blob way up across the field and saying, boy, is that turkey or is that oh that's a good tom oh okay so you can you can save yourself a lot of footsteps with with optics um good knife for the aftercare some people will use face with paint uh, just to kind of break up that shine especially when you get later in the in the may season it gets a little warm for a face mask so a little bit of paint just to break that up it's nice on your hands too because if you start to get proficient in your calling techniques you will find that um, the material in your, your gloves hampers some of the sound. Mm -hmm. So a naked hand is, is preferred for a lot of guys so you just mud up your hands or put a little charcoal or black cover up on that just to you know, kill that, that shine. How many people know what this stuff is? Bathroom. Yeah, someone's there. There you go. Yeah. Uh, this is a spray on tip repellent. Don't put it on your skin. The way they, they tell you to do this is that you take your hunting clothes or work clothes or whatever you need, spray it down outside on a calm day really well, and let it dry. And once it's fully dried, you've got, I think it's up to six washes that you've got full tip repellent, see? And like I said, I'm a surveyor, so I use that stuff quite frequently just to try to keep from having Lyme disease. Uh, so. Well, like if I'm using a blind, I'll spray the skirt of the blind with that as well. Um, chairs, you know, like like this. This is just a little a little cheapy deal. Spray that. Get that. Uh, it is important to get back to comfort. Tips. You're going to be sitting more likely than not in most of these situations. Make sure your rear end is comfortable. If you're sitting at the base of a white pine, all of a sudden you've got a root wearing on your left cheek after five minutes, that's going to be problematic. So Carter's best and most of the best come standard with a, a butt pad. If you don't have that luxury as part of your best, I would invest in a $10 seat that you can just pack on your back and have a little turkey seat uh, to go and be comfortable. The last thing you want to do is he finally You've been working him for an hour, and he starts to you start to see that red head coming, and all of a sudden it's like I gotta move, and that's, just be comfortable. Yeah. Like, you gotta be comfortable. In this Whether it's swatting at a bug or yeah, kind of fixing your butt cheek or whatever, you definitely want to be still when the moment of truth happens. Those little seats will help too. Um, if, you, if your legs tend to fall asleep and get heavy and get pins and needles, mm -hmm. it becomes uncomfortable as well. 
that just elevate yourself a little bit, getting your, your tuchus off the ground, get some blood that's flowing will help as well. And it, it also, I don't know how many people are familiar with kind of the, the typical stance for shooting a turkey when you're um, kind of out up against, say you're up against the base of a tree. Fred will demonstrate here. Most of you can see me, but I mean, you're, you're you want to have here. You want to have the knee up so that you have your elbow locked up against it. Um, if I can trust that, I'm not going to trust that table. <laughs> um, it's a sitting uh, supported position, more or less. You're using your knee as a rest. And then you've got yourself locked in here. This has the seat in the um, little kickstand on it, which seemed like a real unnecessary item, but when you can get. Is the locked tree. in, and you're ready. So you're got your knees bent, feet heels dug in, and you're locked in. So that that gun barrel is not moving at all. That Alps Grand Slam does that Carter's wearing is great for stuff like that where you don't have a tree. Now keep in mind, if you are up against a tree, that frame comfort will become cumbersome, and then when you do get locked in, it's hard to swing around very rigid with that setup. So again, test drive all your gear and put yourself in different situations. Personal choice, kind of what works for you. Um, but you got to go through it, right? So you got to go through the, the turkey hunt and keep going and know what works for you. Otherwise, you're just, just listening to us blow hot air. Right. <laughs> what else we got? Decoys. Good boots. Well, I, I have to start, you know, make sure you oh, got boots. good boots. Boots are key. Waterproof boots, because once that boots. grass starts growing, it collects a lot of dew, and by the time you get to where you're going, you're about to soak and wet. Yep. So. Yep. And you're going to be, if you're right after it, you're going to be going from 4 in the morning till noon. That's a long time to be covering ground, you know, hiking around. So good, dry, waterproof boots. Very should cover come that. Back. Our rules here in New Hampshire, right? So yes. season's May 3rd, rules. May 31st. We have Sunday hunting, others don't. Um, Hunt till noon only. Yep. So um, at the end of this, we can go through proposed season changes, but we want to keep it with what's what. Um, so we'll, here to bird only, one in the spring, we'll get to identifying that, but let's continue with the, uh, the walking stuff here, all our calls and yeah. equipment. Look, so who's run a turkey call before? Who's afraid of turkey calls? You can get it, go ahead. <laughs> Are you? What, which one? All of them to some extent. Oh. Diaphragms are a little tricky. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. No, they are. It th that takes quite a bit of getting used to. But once you, it's kind of like it dawns on you. Once it happens, you're like, oh, hey, how did I not do this before? So. Like with all the gear, calls can get, they run the gamut from a $5 call to hundreds of dollars for certain calls. And again, this is all personal preference. Your $5 calls will kill as much as your $200 kills. Your $20 bone decoy will kill as much as your $100 or $150 decoy. This is, again, it's all personal experience, personal preference. You're going to do what you want. Um, so I would say that there's a, I don't call it a hierarchy, but there's a starting point with your calling. And as you get proficient, you can graduate, but never discount what you started with. And when I say that, I'm talking about push pin calls and box calls. Now, I will admit to you, in my arrogance and my foolishness, as a young turkey hunter, I used a box call to start out, and I thought, well, this is for children and, you know, unexperienced hunters. So once I got proficient with it and I graduated to uh, pot calls and mouth calls, I never considered this. Well, it wasn't until about three years ago, I started putting them back in my vest. And last year, every bird I killed throughout New England and uh, Weston and New York died at the hands of a box call. So don't discount this stuff. You're, what you're going to find, and we're going to probably hammer on this throughout the rest of the talk, is every bird is different, and a sound yes. from today that work, may not work tomorrow. And they're just finicky like that. So it, it, it could be a little tough to have a whole Bass Pro Shops in your vest, <laughs> but having options is going to help you fill your tag. So um, I have three different push pin calls right here. That's exactly what they are. There's a, a push pin. 
and these are friction calls, just wood on wood. All our friction calls, for the most part, we chalk them up. If it's wood on wood, it won't make a, a sound there. But, um, you know, simple design, they work, and they kill turkeys. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I had some. You got some box calls here. Again, the, the, the size and the wood make different, uh, make different sounds. Different pitch. I can't tell you what the wood is on half of these, but I'm not that into it. But, you know, you can hear this one. And then you can hear this one. Different pitch, different wood, different sound. Those are all short boxes. But again, from day to day, and then depending on your conditions, if it's windy, you might want something a little bit more high pitch that screams to cut through that. And where we have, you know, a lot of fragmented forest, and there's some decent terrain here in New Hampshire, um, you know, that sound's not going to carry as far. And the acoustics in a, in a hardwood stand is different than, you know, a, a white pine stand where you're at. So just having the different options. Um, this one here, have, this is called a scratch call. I think what's old is new again. Right. Yeah, this this is an old, stuff. old style type of call. But it's, it's a hollow box and then a little scratch piece. And so it all makes turkey sounds. Uh, let's see here. Show the pot. We have pot calls. This is a, a crystal call. It's glass. All kinds of different surfaces, and they all kind of have different sounds, different pitches, uh, at different volumes even. I have seven. These are calls. Yeah, who's got a question? How do you know? I know they have different pitches. But how would you use those different pitches to call a bird? Good Does question. That matter? Yeah, absolutely. All of them? Yes. Yep. Um, the easy answer is what I'm getting a response at and what's moving. Longer winded answer is, you know, uh, this crystal here. Uh, rain, uh, humidity, high wind. I'm going to this. Uh, I beat my box calls, I just reef on them, but it's because I get the results that way. Some guys will look at me like I'm crazy and they want to be soft. And that's true, you do want to be soft a lot because if you go out there and listen, those hens aren't, aren't hammered. They're not yelping like a crazy man. But, you know, for me, that's. I, I elicit reactions that way and I kill birds. So. I, I like to almost for you. build a scenario, you know, based on the information that's being presented to me. So if I if I have a bird gobble and I just kind of start, I will usually start soft. Even if I'm cold calling, which, you know, if I'm just kind of getting set up in an area, I'm not sure if there's birds around, I'll start slow and soft. Um, just a few contact yelps. You know, just that just, soft. And because if, if there is a bird 100 yards away and I just start, then I will never see that bird. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, and you'll so, be surprised what they can hear, how far oh, away yeah. they can hear. Because I did it this morning. I, I'm lucky enough, I have a whole pile of birds in my neighborhood. They're all bird feeder birds. You can't hunt them. So I, get to, I was going to say, we're going to sell his address. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get to experiment a lot. So I'm, I'm Unfortunately, I have a lot of test subjects, but um, I had one that was out uh, the horse paddock and pasture next door to me. It was about 80, 80, 90 yards, and I just did this off my top, my, my porch. Just that quiet. Oh, and he hammered. And he double hammered. He double clutched it. And I said, how? And he, you know, so it just proves the point. Um, but when you need to reach out, you know, a slate call, which I don't have one. I get this. Uh, I got a slate right here. You got one? This is a Quaker Boy call. It's got three different tone surface, tone boards on it, surface boards, so you can have different. Boards. It's a softer sound, but if I want to reach out with a crystal. You can hear how that resonates differently. Yeah, I agree with that. Right, so I started talking about strikers. I have seven different strikers up here. They're all different wood material. Again, you match. Most of them will come pre-matched with your, you know, your big box store type calls, and they'll work just fine. But if you start to, you know, they're an instrument more or less. You're playing this one, so you start matching the different strikers and the different wood to the different material and what what works and what gets a good sound. Um, but each different striker. 
played on the same exact surface can sound like a different hen to a tom. So you can appeal to that, you know, oh hey, there's like, I've got three strikers in my pocket. He's, there's, there's three different hens, because I'll take this one call, take the other one call, take a third one call, and you'll get three different different sounds. So we have we have crystals, uh, I got a, a polymer, I have aluminum, and I have slate here. So this plastic one that comes with this, specifically for this, I guess it's polymer, different sound. That's, that's like he said, that's three different birds in one call right there. Um, I, that's the call I started out with after box call when I started moving, just because it was economically feasible, but also gave me three different tones. So. And I wasn't dead in the water if it was raining out. Now, does anybody know what this would be? Yeah. Has anybody tried to use one of these? I would highly recommend it. I seriously would, because um, when you get into that third week in May, and a lot of the local turkeys have been called to, shot at, missed, busted, whatever, uh, they, they kind of tend to keep they get track. Smart. They get they keep a little mental inventory of all that. So this is an entirely different sound. And so this is my ace in the hole. I'll, I'll use, you know, all the He's other assortment of call. In on it's this. a He's suction. It's like a, a kiss call almost. Um, What's it called? It's a wing bone call. Okay. And so what that is, is every turkey has three bones in their wing. And so skilled artisans put these together to produce wing bones. And this was actually the earliest known turkey call. Uh, it's believed that uh, the indigenous people were sitting around sucking the marrow out of bones and started making turkey sounds. So that's... You don't have to be a skilled artisan. I yeah. do not, and I put them together just fine with some, some glue, and they work. So you just got to sand them up and trim them, but any, any all can make So you don't buy those? I mean, you can, but you should make your own. It, it's a cool <clears throat> way to commemorate your bird, yeah. too. You know, it's a better, I'd say it's a better sound. The real, the real tone of the, from the bone versus a plastic one or whatever, but again, that's up to you. You, you do what, what works for you. Yeah. There's a whole slew of calls we don't even have here. Right. Trumpet calls and right. tube calls. Why don't you show the diaphragm real quick, yeah. and then we'll talk about like vocabulary. So again, all different material <coughs> with these diaphragms, and, and like the gentleman said, this can be the most intimidating uh, and I think immediately from the choking hazard that these present. <laughs> yeah, do not swallow. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's one and done kind of thing. When you go to Bass Pro Shops or Cabela's and you buy one of these diaphragm calls, it's not like you could try it. And yeah, they it don't back. want it back. It's um, pretty gross, but um, you want to make sure that it fits, again, comfort, because if it's tickling or choking you, mm -hmm. you're not going to be a very effective caller. Um, what is nice, is, and everyone should learn to run a diaphragm call, is this is, this is my finisher. I always pinch one in my cheek so that when the bird does come into range, uh, you know, obviously I'm up here like this here, I, I can't manipulate a call. Some guys have mounted calls, but I don't, I don't want to move my finger. I just, the only finger I want to move is this one here. <laughs> um, so when he does come into range, if i got to seal the deal with that little finisher, I just kind of come over and and if that's enough to get him to stick his head up, that's it. So these calls, most of them are latex. If you have a latex allergy, talk to the call makers or talk to the staff people at the big box stores and find a uh, prophylactic. They make, they make them in, in, in both types, so you don't want to have a, a reaction while you're turkey hunting. Right, that would so, be good. Um, they're stacked <coughs> latex reeds. This one happens to have... Uh, one and then the cut. This is uh, most of y'all can't see it. This is a V cut. Any V cut turkey uh, diaphragms are gonna have more of a rasp to them. Um, and then, all right, 
right? So there's the half moon shape. You and want goes up to there's the a U here. You want the, the opening of the U facing out. Are you blowing out, sucking in? Are you making any so kind of noise? This is, no, this is pressure. So my tongue is pushing up on the roof of my mouth, and I'm, I'm pushing air over it, and that air exercises the, the reeds. So when you put, when you try these out for the first time, just blow the air. And up. And the curved part goes towards the back. You want the open, the open end to go out front. Look, when I first started, I had no one to teach me, and we didn't really have YouTube, so I did like this. <laughs> I went like this. <laughs> I started sucking off and all sorts of crazy stuff. So no one, no one's perfect from jump. You figure it out, but. That's the best way, and, and the less reads on a diaphragm, the easier they are to run. So don't, you know, for you new guys, or even experienced guys that have a hard time with it, try to do something with a two or a one read. You're going to be able to get some good sound out of it. As you get more proficient, understand turkey talk, you start stacking them up, you know, three and four read calls. And each read will have a different cut, and like Fred said, um, some of these I don't even know what they're called, they just make stuff up. Ghost cut, bad way cut. Favorite. The B cut, you know, they, they all have different tones and sounds that you can kind of produce with them. This call has a really pronounced foam uh, frame in it, which I'm not a fan of. It drives me nuts a lot. I really don't use that. It, all this is is tape around here, the different colored tape. And some of you may need to trim that down because the top of your mouth doesn't accommodate that at all. Some people, once they get good, they just take that tape off and they just run just the, the frame with the latex in it. I wouldn't recommend doing that until you, you know, you get proficient. Right. If you do, tie a piece of dental floss on it so you can pull it out the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, the ghost cut Carter mentioned, um, I, I can't believe I don't have one with me. It's in, it's in my vest at home. It's, um, it's kind of it's almost like a little, little notch. A little, yeah. Cut out of it. It's very simple. But what's key about that is the easiest call to make a key key call on. And the kiki call, we just start going yeah, into what, let's talk what means what. Uh, your young turkeys, your poults, uh, they make this as a locator sound, like, hey, where are you, mama? Where are you at? And it's a, it's a whistle. It's a, it's a key, key, key. More or less. Now, I think I can make it with this one here. Nope, not that one. Not that one. You have one? Yep. It's got too much rasp. So what I found is you can take a regular diaphragm call, be calling with it, and then if you need the key key, you can flip it upside down. <laughs> Typically the key key is used in the fall for our fall season, that's what people like to use them. Do not discount the mm. kinky call in the spring. I killed plenty of gobblers. Mm -hmm. He talked about that being his ace in the hole. That kiki call, if I can't get a gobbler, and I know he's there, I see him, I can't get him to respond, I will kiki at him, and almost every time, like almost 100% of the time, they come. Right. And so just, I wouldn't overuse it, but have it right, ready. Just to have it as, you know, it's like having a toolbox. Can you kiki with the, uh, uh, the box call? I cannot. Because I'm just not that good. I know fellas that can. Carter, can you do it on a slate? I don't know if this one will. You gotta run it on the outside. You gotta on a slate, just real quick. The higher pitch tones are all gonna be on the outside. Once you start working towards the middle, you go into the deeper, slower tones, which can be helpful uh, if you want to sound like a Jake or a Tom yelping. Uh, and pretty much any time you do any sort of the tom vocabulary, it's going to be just like the hen, just lower, slower, and deeper. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I've done that before. Is I, I had a tom where he'd gobble, but then he'd start yelping. And so instead of messing around with any gobble sounds, I would just kind of do a couple deep yelps and then play the outside of the call and do a couple hen yelps. So it was painting the picture of a tom with a hen. So. You can, and again, this is all practice, but you can purr, you can, you know, you can cut on a box call, so it's not just yelping. But... So, okay, so first of all, the yelp. All right, go ahead. 
<laughs> the Yelp is basically, if do you want to, uh, to demonstrate or Yelp is basically it's just a contact call, and the Yelp can have different meanings based on. Ooh, oh, squeaky. Um, that's the mouse call. Um, it, it has different meanings. So if it's just like, it's okay. It's just I'm over here, you over there. Yep. But as it starts to gets that excitement building, and and again, I like to paint an audible scenario for a turkey, especially once I have one that's. I know where he is, it's me against him, I'm trying to convince him that I'm the hen that's worthwhile for him to break his code of the hen going to him. These birds are just like, I tell the, it's kind of a lame joke, but I always tell this joke, men are inherently lazy, ladies, yes, baby? So the turkeys, from a turkey to a cardinal, all your birds, they have beautiful, vibrant colors, you know, and you notice the female are very dull. Um, survival mechanism, they, they sit there and hide their babies and their eggs when they're on their nest. And the male puts on a big show with all the colors and all the pomp and circumstance of a strutter. So when you're calling, when you're hen calling to a turkey, you're working against his programmed little walnut-sized brain, you know, the biology of the bird. So if you get a bird to break from his strut zone, his area, if you come to you, you, you it's counterintuitive to how the bird wants to act naturally. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, you were talking about the, the young birds. Sure. Yeah. Why, why, why would a Tom be attracted to that? If it's a young bird. It's a gathering. Right. And now this, it's a good question. Um, I've used the kiki and I've also used the purr, which I'll, I'll kind of leads in with, with your question. Um, That purr is just a contented eating, give me some space, you stay over there. So what I like to do is say the bird is gobbling. Everybody loves to hear the bird gobble. So the kind of the general thought is, well, I'll just keep, keep yelping and doing stuff that makes them gobble. Well, you get addicted to the gobble. You get addicted to the gobble. Mm -hmm. But what that does is, that gives him the confidence he needs. Well, he's doing everything right. He's going to stay strutting, you know, 100 yards over that way. I like to kind of flip it on him a little bit, and yeah, I'll get him fired <coughs> up with some yelps, and then you want to show some cutting real quick. Cutting is, hey, I'm, I'm getting excited. I'm, I'm ready to, to procreate over here. A lot of different ways I'm that you can, can, can do the cutting. Um, so, so I'll throw that in. I'll do some yelps. I'll do some cutting, and I'll read his temperature. So if if he gets all excited when I jump up into that cutting, uh, I will oftentimes just if I know he's double gobbling and getting all excited, I'll stop and I'll just sit there and be quiet. And he'll gobble and gobble and gobble, and I'll let him kind of keep keep looking and make him desperate. And then I'll throw in either a kiki or a purr to let him know He's still here. I'm still here. Make him come home. But I'm, I'm bored. I'm, I've grown tired of you, and it's the hard to get. So that's something if, that- If you're hunting with a buddy, I yeah, this, I try not to, <clears throat> it's a tactic. If you're hunting with a buddy, you're calling, have your buddy, if the bird's not in sight, you know for a fact you can move with terrain, have your buddy walk off, go like 20, 50 yards, and call on the way out. <laughs> and that, that bird will start, he'll come, come, come for the last call he heard, and now he's gonna, that's his travel route, he's gonna follow her wherever she's headed, where he thinks she's headed. Um, so we've got the yelp, the purr, the um, we got the fly down cackle which the fly down and the fly up uh, is basically that first thing in the morning you get the they're still on the roost 
It's just soft talk going. Just that sleepy, quiet, closer to the middle of the call of the, the pot, or uh, if you're on a box, just gentle, uh, nothing really aggressive. But then that, that goes into what Fred just did, is where you have the... And they don't always cackle, but that's the sound that they will often make when they fly down. Combined with... Right, the hat doing that on your leg, if you can get away with the movement. Right. And that's the thing, is you want to make sure, like, if you're set up within sight of where you think he's roosted, you don't want to pull out the, the hat trick. Basically. I don't know if we said it, but don't sit under the rooster. Yeah, don't. They won't serve you any good. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Just, you just get turned on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fine pitch on you. Right. Um, so, and now everybody knows what a gobble sounds like, I'm assuming. Has everybody heard a gobble? Because that is... If you've not heard a wild turkey gobble, go YouTube it. Because it is a different sound than a barnyard turkey. Because that's what you're accustomed to. Barnyard turkey is lower, <clears throat> slower. It's more of a, a jake pal more than anything. So those little jakes, I had one out this morning. Um, they'll try to get that full-throated gobble out, but they've not gone through puberty all the way. So they can't really... They get a little squeak. They haven't, yeah, they, they choke halfway through it and they kind of... Yeah, their, their but you can tell a lot about a gobble. You can kind of read the temperature of him, you know, because if he's gobbling a lot, then you know you've got him fired up, and it's a good, good thing. If he's very sparing, like he's almost giving you the courtesy gobble, then you know kind of how you want to respond to that. If the gobble sounds like it's going farther away, and then coming closer, and then going farther away and coming closer, or even left right, he's strutting. Or he's still, if it's early enough, he's still on the roost, and he's gobbling this way, right. and then gobbling this way. And it, it can affect how you uh, decide you're going to do your hunt, basically. We didn't cover it in the scouting, but if you go to a spot, you know, you're only going to find this really in like a, a sandy area or some mm -hmm. good uh, loose loam. If you find a spot where you got them pterodactyl feet going through it and there's lines on either side of it running parallel, that is a strut zone. So when the turkey comes out, he puts his his, his uh, black feathers, uh, dark feathers out there. Is that right? Yeah, wing, wing feathers. His big wing feathers. He's dragging them. And when you eventually kill one, you harvest your bird, you're going to see they're all worn down. He's, he's dragging them. So if you ever find that, you know that the problem in New Hampshire is you don't have all day. So you're not really certain when he's going to show up. Chances are first thing in the morning after he pitches out, does a little feeding, he's going right to his strut area to start putting on his show. So you can safe bet to hang out there. Another thing that you want to look for is dust bowls. Yeah. In the sandy, loose dirt areas, especially like uh, power lines or places where ATVs edges. have gone through, edges under oak. You know, like an oak underneath the on the edge of the field. Uh, these dust bowls are where they groom themselves, and they'll rid themselves of parasites. They'll roll and fluff, and um, that's a spot that they will typically make part of their daily routine. Fishermen in here, everyone fish. So you go this time of year, start seeing all the bass beds when you're cruising around. They look just like a bed, a fish bed. So, um, yeah. Can you talk about uh, using an alcohol at night? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you have any. I bring a locator. I, I keep an, a locator call with me right here all the time. I, I don't use like a locator call. I've just always used. A... He's good. And it's what that does, that's the barred owl. And that cadence is who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all, is the way I've always remembered it. And what that does is, um, owls and turkeys, not so much. They don't like each other. It's, um, it's a great way to get a shock gobble from a bird without giving up any turkey calling. So I, I would prefer to get either an unsolicited gobble or a gobble from a shock call. So, so the owl said, this time of year, do yourselves a favor. Leave your turkey calls at home when right. you go out scouting. Use your locator call. So, like he's saying, an owl, a crow, um, peleated woodpecker, a hawk, even a goose call. Chainsaw a goose works. Call. 
<laughs> yeah, good call works well. Slamming your car door. Yep. So any sharp, sudden sound. Um, I've heard birds go crazy at, um, actually, the Bruins game. <laughs> uh, somebody down here at this house had the doors open and the windows open, and they were screaming and hollering, and every time they'd scream and holler, bird would call. And I didn't have to do a thing. I just, <laughs> perfect. Uh, but this is a crow call. So to answer your question, when you're putting birds to bed at night in the roost, or if you need to know where a tom is first thing in the morning, but you don't want to use a turkey call yet because you're not really sure how you want to be tactical, I guess is a good way to put it for that situation. <coughs> An owl call is great evening, early morning. Once you get on towards a seven, eight o'clock, just the crow. And uh, what that does is that'll, if he's fired up, ready to go, and then he'll gobble at that. And then you can say, okay, he's pinpointed over there on that ridge. I know from my scouting and knowing where the terrain is that if I can stay at his same level or a little higher than him, then I've got a good chance of setting up and calling him in. Terrain is important. Um, you want to know the woods. You want to know where your swamps, your seeps, your brooks, stone walls, uh, barbed wire fences especially. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how many turkeys' lives have been spared because they would come to the barbed wire fence and just strut back and forth and wait. And, and just never come in. Uh, you can gobble call the birds as well. I, I do want to go over this because it's out there. So when you're using a gobble, be careful where you're yeah. at, right? So if you're on any of the 100 uh, wildlife management areas here in New Hampshire, probably not a good deal to, to run on. But if, you, if you're on a piece of private dirt, you know um, with almost 100% certainty who's out there and who's supposed to be. Um, you know, gobbling is a, is a fine option. It's not always going to work. None of this stuff is always going to work, but having a, another tool in your toolbox helps. And when you gobble, now you're working on what he's doing. You're working on his dominance, and you're putting another bird in his bedroom. So I'm, I'm here for your property, and I'm here for your ladies. What are you going to do about it? So you're challenging him to a fight. Which um, could work for you or against you, depending on his tone and his demeanor. And what yeah, he you just could definitely scare him off. Right. Um, Skilled guys can gobble on diaphragm calls. Um, I'm slowly learning. You can gobble on a box call as well, uh, some proficient, but uh, this is a, a two call here. It's a, a poly call. And it's just a, just a one. So if you break that and cut that off, You could imitate a jig, or it sounds like a jig to them. It sounds better when you get outside of a room. <laughs> and, and leading into that, as far as the decoy goes, um, I very rarely would use a strutting jig myself. Um, and if I did, again, it would be in a space where I know 100% certain that the topo features are right in front of me so that nobody's going to be able to come up from behind me and think it's a real live live Jake or real blood bird. Um, but that being said, you probably notice how awful and ratty looking that tail is. That's on purpose. Because you don't want to have this you know, big full fan and have an intimidating looking, looking bird. Um, I prefer a hand decoy. Uh, and if I am going to use a bird, it would probably be just like a, a Jake standing you know, not a quarter stripe. A quarter stripe, yeah. All the decoys nowadays, and you can see how real these these ones look, right? So the more real they look, typically the more expensive they are. But again, you can kill birds with, you know, the foam. feather flex foam, roll up, put them in your vest or your pocket and go. It's just a, a confidence builder. Yeah. Um, but they make them in all uh, positions. So you got a full strut here. Um, a, these are happen to be A, B, and X decoys. And they have a half strut, so he's, he's kind of he's strutted up, his tail's half up, a quarter strut. They have hands that are breeder hands, they have feeder hands with their head down, then they have a lay down hand where you can pair her with a 
any jig really, a half strut or a quarter strut that can simulate breeding activity going on. So if he does come over that ridge and he looks, he's like, oh no, you do not. You know, and he now his head is red and he's coming. So um, again, you get, like Carter said from jump, you're creating scenarios. You're putting on a, a show form and you know, some days it's gonna work, some days it's not. I, like you said, I like the quarter strut Jake paired with a, a standing hen and that seems to work great for me. Right. And, I, and I've had Jake decoys work. I've had, you know, full, full toms see that and just turn and go. Um, you know, we've seen six packs of Jake's yeah. beat up on four-year-old toms. Yeah. Uh, that, that will happen. Yeah. So they, they see one, they think, uh-oh, the rest of them must be around here somewhere. You don't have to use a decoy. Right. I know a lot right. in, in turkey education and a lot of turkey TV, you know, this is always a part of it. I know plenty of people that go without yeah. decoys. Yeah. Um, one, it's a situation. Hard, hard body decoys like this, it's kind of tough to carry around. They don't really pack up as well. Um, the later in the season you go, the grass is higher, so your decoys really aren't doing you any good on the edge. You're hunting woodlock birds, so you might as well just get comfortable next to a tree and just use your, your woodsmanship and your calling ability and practice that. They will come to that, and you will kill plenty of turkeys without a decoy. Yes? You ever hide from a tree stand? Ball hunters do it, not in spring. Right. 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 Um, one thing I do want to throw out there is um, when you are in the woods and you hear a turkey, at least this is, this is what I do, I will kind of temper what I hear by saying that very well could be another hunter. Exactly. Always assume Always it's another hunter. Always assume it's another hunter until you know otherwise. Because, first of all, I, I don't like stepping on somebody else's hunt. I don't like people stepping on my hunt. Ethics are so important in the turkey hunting realm. Um, so if I hear a gobble, or if I hear a series of yells, I'm just going to kind of wait. And then, you know, I, I had that happen to me this past spring with my son. We were out hunting and we heard this awful sounding calling. I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody's jumping in on us. So we, we just kind of were hunkering there, we're like, oh, what do you want to do, you know? And pretty quick, that awful calling, here comes this hen. Oh, and just lessons learned. So uh, sometimes the best move is just to hunker. Let's put a pin in the ethics part, because I do want to come back yes. to this, but yeah. uh, we need to identify what we're, what we're shooting here. Yeah. Right? So the yep. rule here in New Hampshire is, uh, a bearded bird can be harvested, and that's because your hens, you can have bearded ladies out there. Does everybody know what the beard is? This is just kind of a poor example. It's a Jake beard. Um, it comes right off their chest. It's actually hard and feathers, it's right? It's feathers. Yep. Yep. And they, they kind of, as a bird grows, so this would be a Jake. So a Jake would have like a three, four inch beard first year. Second year, he grows another nine eight, nine inch. Then you get into your three and four year old birds, which you're looking at 10 and a half, 11. Uh, being here in the North Country, oftentimes what will happen is they'll be up on a roost. They can stay on the roost for up to 10 days without food in the cold if they have to. And so during that time, they can get their beard freezing to the limb. And so oftentimes you can see a 20 plus pound bird with just kind of a scraggly, short little beard. Yep. Um, spurs are the other thing. As a bird matures, you know, on his first year, he'll have just little quarter inch nubs, jake nubs. Second, or uh, by the time he's a two year old, typically they're about three quarters of an inch. When you start getting into the inch plus, you're looking at the three year old, four year old bird. Granite State, these spurs will get rubbed down. Yeah. So it's really difficult. If you get a bird with spurs in the inch plus, that's that's quite something. Rely on the beard. After yeah. the first week, you're I mean even the first week, you're hardly gonna be able to see spurs to confirm. Right? right? Male birds only grow spurs. Um, in, in, even with the naked eye, unless you got a good set of specs. You're, you're not going to see those. So rely on the beard. The beard is the key. And then after you've identified a bearded bird, you need to decide, all right, is it a hen? Is it a, is it a mature bird that I want to harvest? 
in the springtime as a personal uh, account, I will not take a bearded hen as much as I want to uh, because I'm giving her the opportunity to breed and, and lay out them eggs and have more. Um, now in the fall, it's a different situation. It's kind of all things are up and we can talk about that. But we're looking for colors. We're looking for the, the most patriotic bird in the land, the red, white, and blue head. And all these colors communicate a mood. They communicate to other birds what's happening. So uh, red, that bird comes in red. You know, he's hot. He wants to fight. Um, see a lot of decoys now are moving to an all white head. This is, I'm getting ready to breed. And that white head is communicating to other birds that this is going down. And so if, you, if they want to fight, they see that's that. the strategy behind it. Same thing with the light blues. Um, but the coloration also, you know, snood, the hen won't have a snood here, if you can actually see it. And it's pretty remarkable how fast these things will elongate and then how fast they'll go back. You know, again, it's all temperature and, uh, and mood of the bird. Excitement, yeah. Um, waddles as well, these three crossbows. Um, hens won't have them. I mean, they got these little nubs in here, but I mean, really three pronounced. So these are identifying marks that you're going to want to confirm to yourself that this is a bird I want to take, and that's illegal. But the beard makes it legal, no matter what. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that from what? I've never heard that. 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 Oh, I thought. It's a chance it's sticking out and you can see it, it's three inches or longer. So. How common are multiple beards? Multiple More than you would think. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like the one of the holy grails, I guess, if you will, of, of turkey hunting. If you shoot something with a double beard, that's, oh boy, hey, did you hear Joe shot a double bearded bird? I've seen a lot of triple bearded birds die this year already from friends throughout the country. Uh, you got double spurred turkey. Double spurred. Really this rare. Anomalies, yeah. Uh, identifying turds, I want this to go back key, to that. Yeah. Uh, you got this Dairy Queen soft serve looking thing here. Those are your female birds. Uh, the male birds will lay a J hook there, uh, and you can associate J with Jake, you know, and that Jake's an immature bird. So if you see a, a cane or a J, you know, you got a, a, a male bird in the area. So if you got a whole pile of these, uh, depending on the time of year, it's probably a, a brood flock or, you know, just a bunch of hens hanging together. Don't hunt these in the spring. Find hunt your J's those. and hunt those areas. Yeah. You didn't come here thinking you're going to get science and turkey turds, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's, there's the important identification stuff on your bird. And um, so you've done all this, you've gotten to that point, you pull the trigger, you release the arrow, and your bird is, is on the ground and it's over. You did it. You, you're, you're feeling the joy that every turkey hunter goes through finally at some point in their career. And uh, first thing, fill out your turkey tag. Make right? sure you have the Detached, turkey tag fill that out. purchased before you go. And just, I want to put a pin on that. Um, Anybody that turkey hunts needs a turkey tag. Youth hunters, yes. everybody needs a turkey tag. So um, if you've got, you know, this coming up youth weekend, if you're taking somebody out that's under 16, make sure they have a tag. Make sure you got a pen or two in your pocket. Mm -hmm. um, if not, a, qu a, a quill, quill and, some, and some blood will suffice. <laughs> They'll show intent anyway to the CEO if they stop you. Can you talk about your own, own, right? One bird. Right now it's one bird in the spring. Yeah. Can you talk about hunting on your own property relative to licensing? Still need it. It's not like a deer or a bear where you can get the special tag in the yeah. back of the digest. You still need a turkey tag. Private property or otherwise. Um, so you, you harvest the bird, uh, you fill your tag out, you dug your Facebook, your selfie, whatever you call it, mom, let her know how awesome you are. Um, we bring these birds to the check stations intact. You can field dress them as far as you know, removing the innards, but for biological reasons, we want to keep these birds together. So uh, the faster we get them to the check station to cool that meat down, the better. All right, so just like anything, but keep them whole. Don't start breasting them out. And, you know, we got to weigh them. We got to get uh, beard and spur length on them. And uh, that's about it. And getting back to archery real quick. If you are an archer, make sure you know where you're shooting. We can cover this, we should have. Uh, shotgun, shotgun hunters, you're aiming here. Right, you're shooting, you're getting headshots. These birds are tough, this is like Kevlar. You're hitting them with all that blended load. It's pretty much just gonna bounce off. 
So hit them in the head, in the neck. Archery hunters um, aim here. You can aim broadside where the, the triangle is, just like every other critter where the wing meets the, the body. Now, God also gave them a perfect bullseye, you know, so <laughs> if you're so inclined, I wouldn't take that shot, but it's, it's a lethal, uh, ethical kill shot, so. Make sure you know your ranges with your archery. You don't want any injured birds with archery equipment. Uh, with with all all weapons. With all of them, but I mean, but especially with archery. With your guns and the technology that's out there, and the available uh, blended loads, and now the tungsten super shot. Um, once you know your range and your patterns, these birds are they're dead once they come in. Um, unless you just get you know totally excited and you look over your sights and you. Sh you that's never dead. happened. Take a breath. <laughs> Take a breath. Right. Focus yourself. You owe it to yourself for all the work you put into, and ultimately you owe it to this animal. Uh, we want to give them quick, clean deaths, yes. and uh, that's going to preserve, make your, your culinary experience better as well. You don't and want to mess with that later on. You want to make sure that you take time and pattern your weapon, pattern your shotgun, uh, so that in, it goes back to the rangefinder. You know, okay, my this particular load and this particular gun with this choke shoots really well out to 30 yards, but then it just falls off. So I'm not going to take any shots past 30 yards. Um, know your equipment. It's you know it's your kind of your obligation to the to the turkeys. Now then again, getting back to certain technology and these loads and, and chokes, shotgun chokes. And you can take long shots, but be proficient. Do this for a while before you start taking. You know, 50 yard and above pokes at a bird, but know that it's it's available and it's out there to you. So just just be proficient at your stuff. Um, ethics. So let's go back to ethics. Um, this time of year, we're all looking. You don't really see a lot of people looking because everyone's doing it on their own time. Inevitably, May 3rd, you go to show up, and there's a couple trucks there. Do yourself a favor. Just keep driving. Have a plan. Have a few plan places C. to go. Because if, if there's a truck there, and who cares if it's a 40 acre piece or if it's a 400 acre piece, you have no idea where that hunter is. He, he beats you, say, plain and simple. Don't go in there thinking, well, he's probably on the other side, I'm going to set up here. You just don't want the aggravation. This is, this is a fun adventure. You want to have a good time, especially if there's young kids involved. You just don't want the interaction. Plenty of public places to hunt, but like Carter said, have a B and a C plan so that if you get out there May 3rd, your spots are, someone's there, move on. Just, just go. Um, if you see somebody in the act of calling a bird, don't, don't go undercut them. Don't go, oh, I know I can get around here and I can cut that bird off. That's just really crap. Mm -hmm. It's just not a nice thing to do. And there's so few of us that do this. I mean, just what a terrible way to, to come into turkey hunting or, you know, for the experience of that other hunter too. So, um, you know, put some work into it. Do your homework. Scouting. Don't truck shop. Don't don't drive around and you know they're parked there, so there's got to be something here. That's just a real rotten way to, to get yourself involved, and it just it ruins it for everybody. And, you know, some people end up going to jail because they start fighting on the side of the road, and you just that's not no right. turkey is worth any of that aggravation. So be be neighborly, be ethical about this stuff. Now, is there anything that anybody would like a little clarity or any questions or anything? I was thinking, did you want to go over, because I know it's in the law book, but there are restrictions on shot size. Yep, yep. Well, I um, actually wanted to mention that. Right now. Did they clear that all up? Is that for 2019? That's 19. Okay. Yeah. So right now, sevens are the, the small. smallest that you can use. Um, 20 gauge, 16, and 12, and 10. Um, right now, four tens are not. A legal means of taking a bird in New Hampshire. Um, archery, seven eighths. Um, thirty pounds. Thirty pounds. Seven eighths broadhead is um, thirty pound draw. Uh, half hour before sunrise until noon. In the spring. In the spring. Are bullheads legal for for New Hampshire? For I think so. Okay. Yeah. Yep. There's no yeah for expandables. There's no top end. Uh, is the archery the same season as rifle? The archery in, in, the the, in, in the in the spring. In the spring. Now, season. that's a good point. You can only use either shotgun or archery in the spring. Right. You can use a muzzle loader as long as it's a shotgun. 
but only something that distributes a shot pattern or an arrow. Um, then we do have a fall season. It runs September 15th to December 15th in uh, most of the wildlife management units. And that entire three month season is archery. And there is a seven day season, second about week, third week, October, October, week, about October. Third week of October that runs Monday to Sunday. And that is half hour before to half hour after sunset. You can all day hunt and you can take any sex. So there's just more opportunity there. Now, next year, if, when, when that rule changes, because it sounds like it's going to, uh, you're going to have the opportunity to kill two birds in the spring, but you forego your fall tent. So two bird season for, for a and year. The, the proposal is that instead of May 3rd, it's going to start on May 1st. Yeah, what's the magic thing about May 3rd as opposed to May 3rd? That's, that that's been it for as long as I can remember. Um, and, it, and it's this May 1st will kind of bring us into better parity with other local states. Mm -hmm. So that kind of keeps it a little more even. Um, getting back to your harvested bird, do yourself a favor and, and try to eat all of it. Mm -hmm. Just rest these things right. out because there is. There's a lot of good. There's meat. a lot of good meat in here. There's a lot of good meat uh, underside here. So there's a lot more of these birds. Use the use the bones and the carcass for stock. You can make a real fine uh, soup out of them. So crock pot, uh, you know, turkey use sandwiches. Up. Use the legs. Yes, you can you can break those down, slow cook those legs, and they're just as tender as anything else. They're really good. Uh, uh, not yet. That was another one of the proposals. And that's probably that, that crossbows be allowed to be used during shotgun in the spring. In the spring. Right. Right. Oh, any other questions? What's your favorite dish of preparation for uh, turkey? turkey poppers? No, I, I take these. I'll take a piece you know of fry. Well, I, I'll take a piece of breast meat. <clears throat> take a sweet pepper, small sweet lunchbox pepper, a little bit of cream cheese. Put that right on top, wrap it in bacon, and put that on the grill. Try saying no to that. That's really good. A lot. My, my wife makes turkey tenders and yeah. grilled turkey, and nothing goes to waste. And you can cook these just like a butterball yeah. tea. You can mm -hmm. roast the whole turkey in an oven. I've never had a tender one, though. No. Uh, flavor injector. Or brine them. They'll keep them nice and moist. I promise you. i tell you, one of the best ways to cook them is to slice the breast thin, pound it, dip it in seasoned flour. Fry it in olive oil, then add a cup of wine, like schnitzel, the capers, oh, make like a turkey for We're all going to his it's house again. <laughs> I only have it once every seven years. Oh, it's <laughs> Let know the first time somebody shoots a bird. Oh, good point. The first time, it, it's not been like The first time you shoot a turkey, if you haven't already, be prepared. Their central nervous system. You ever heard the expression chicken with his head cut off? You can make a very lethal, instantaneous shot and still have that bird flop all around. So first of all, don't, don't think, oh, I made a bad shot. I'm a horrible hunter. But what I'll do is just to kind of keep the bird intact or keep it from breaking bones or whatever, is I'll go up to it, not running with a loaded gun. Please don't do that. Uh, but I'll go up to it and I'll fold the wings like this. Be mindful and, of those legs. And, yes, and watch watch the spurs. Um, and I'll just kind of just kind of hold it until it expires. Usually within you know twenty seconds. Many a turkey hunter have been punctured in the meat of the, the yeah. hand there. And you those, get a turkey and some stitches those to mean go business. with it. You also have the option if you can. You can. Uh, Put your foot on the head, just control yep. them that way. And you don't have to be gruesome about it, but it's just another way just to just, just let it go. Yeah. Does it get a lot more difficult as the season goes on. They no, get it's easier. It becomes a lot of people will Probably. say it, it's harder. It gets a little bit easier. Your hands are now laying because you're right now. They're breeding. They're breeding. As, right? as you said in the back, they're breeding, and the whole purpose of having that may early May, May 3rd begin, uh, is so that a certain percentage of the breeding is kind of underway before the season starts. So 28 days later, by 
late May, early June, the hens are starting to lay. And that frustrates the toms because they're not available for, for party time. So Additionally, most of your hunters are out of the woods. Yeah. In that first two weeks, most people are, have either tagged out or they've just given up. They don't have the time, right? It's, it's a 30-day it's a season, and you only have till noon. And most people got to go to work Monday through Monday. They don't really have the time. I mean, my total advice to being a very successful turkey hunter is to tell your boss and your significant other that you're going to take the whole month of May off to do nothing but hunt. And then when you're done with your divorce lawyer and going to unemployment, then you can hunt. The other thing I would recommend for people who wear hearing aids, you know, that when you shoot the turkey and you get them, that you take them out and put them in your pocket. Because oh. my, my friend and I were high-fiving because we doubled three years ago. And he ripped his face mask off, and the three thousand dollar hearing aid went flying out. Out for the leaf litter. So for that sixteen pound bird, that was a lot of money. Oh, that's all right. All this will make us a heck of a lot more than three grand, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. I hear you. When do you dress them? Um, I typically do it during the course of how I process a bird. Never. Um, I don't really have a need to take the the innards out. Oh yeah. No. Um, by the time I take the bird, tag it, bring it to the check station, my immediate mission is to go to my little bench that I've got set up, and I like to skin it out. You know, Fred will pluck. I, I, I like do it all. I like having the skin it all out and have my Ziploc bags ready. And I'll take this piece of meat, put it in here, take this piece of meat, and I'll cut them up into like individual serving sizes. If it's a particular right really warm May. Bring a cooler, just yep. put some bags of ice in it, just toss it right in there. Most of your bird, if you're fit, having a bird that's too big for your cooler, make sure I, I get a text photo of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments, anything? How do you pluck them if you want to pluck them? So I'll, I'll, uh, I'm, a, I'm a trapper, so I have a skin and gambrel, and so I'll hang them up just like I would my a raccoon or something, and then I pull down. So the feathers are all going up this way, and I just kind of rip. And it goes quick, 15 minutes, like and have the whole thing. Now, be careful with it because the skin is fragile. You don't want to go, you know, if there's resistance, stop. You know, just get a couple at a time and uh, you know, rip that skin. It's going to, you're going to make up for that when you're cooking them. But uh, on these, you know, cut the legs off. Typically, I, I do it up here. And however you want to display, uh, if you want to keep them intact or you just want to trim this here for, you know, spur neck. Some people like spur necklace if that's your thing. Um, your tails, there's a, what's the technical term for it? There's a spot yeah, where it's it meets the bottom. Oh, oh, the Parsons nose. Yeah, and you can just yeah. cut with a, a pocket knife, right? the thing will pop right off. Um, and then you can start going into it and processing. And then once it's done, you bring it to your wife now. It's like, I'm kidding, Lee. That's, that's, that's my <laughs> wife. That's the story I tell about my wife. She is a non-hunter, and first time I did this with her, she says, oh, now it looks like a turkey. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, while we have, oh, yes. What? Do you know how the toms make that low um, bass sound? They're drumming? Yeah, I guess, I don't know yeah, what it's called. Yeah, we did the spit and drum. Um, it, it's a vibration of that air sac. It's that, they get that. That was another thing I was going to talk about with the gobbling. It's when you start to hear the rattle incorporated into it, you know it's getting closer. But with that spit and drum, that <laughs> that is a telltale sign. He's close. Don't move. He's close. Don't move. Do not move eyes. because he may have stopped gobbling 15 minutes ago, and you're just like, oh, did I do something wrong? Did I swear at him? What's going on? All of a sudden, you hear that. That's a, if you work a bird for long enough and you, you've had an interaction, it sounds like he's getting close and he cuts off. That's when you want to just, just sit, right. especially if your body's saying, all right, I gotta get to try another spot. I'm a running gunner myself. I like to get up and go and just keep working different areas. Um, give yourself 20 minutes. As soon as your, your brain tells you to get up and move, tell your brain to shut up and just sit there for 20 more minutes. Because typically that's when that bird has come in and check out where he last heard. And you're laughing, so it's happened to you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's happened to all of us. Son of a gun, there he is in the field of crap. So give yourself that 20 minutes. I ain't going to hurt nothing. 
Right. And most of the time they'll come walking in silent. And oftentimes when he does stop gobbling, no, that's when I get the most excited. Yeah. He's because good. he's committed at that point. Because when he's gobbling, he's still thinking you, the hen's going to him. Yeah. But when he shuts up, get ready. You ever heard him up behind you? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like the movies are well, sometimes you yeah. just call another bird in from another piece that you weren't even working, right. and they surprise you. They sneak in on. So just be prepared for all of it. How far away from you would you set up a decoy? It depends on your on your range, your weapon, and the topo, but 20, 20 yards. yards. And then offset them from you. Right. Safety reasons, one. So right. if another hunter comes in and he happens to square up with you, you're not going to get a rain of pellets. Um, but then also, line of sight, if that bird sees beyond the decoy and sees you flinch, you know, at least if it's offset, they're looking at it and you're over you know, one way or another. How do you deal with not really being able to see the beards like uh, right off the roof sometime in the morning when it's not really the light in the woods? You wait. want to be 100% sure yeah. before you squeeze the trigger. So you can't take it back. You, once you squeeze, you can't take it back. Okay. So, so I would rather wait and, you know, I'm 99% I'm sure yeah, that's exactly. a Tom. Yeah. I've, I have kept pressure from going on the trigger for that 1% okay. many times. <laughs> Any of our fine New Hampshire conservation officers are not going to appreciate yeah, uh, I thought I saw I a beard. I thought I saw a beard. Yeah, that's they, not going to yeah. They're great guys, but they're going to they're gonna hang you up for trouble. They have to be on the ground. <laughs> yes. You cannot shoot a bird, cannot shoot any turkey in a roost tree. Um, Good luck. I mean, it, it can be done. Right, right. I, I, I mean, guys that have done it. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. As long as it's not in the tree, not, not, not sitting on the tree. Right. Again, know your what's beyond your target as well. That's yeah, very important. Anybody else? Do you know about using dogs in the fall? Yes. Dogs in the fall are legal. Dogs in the spring are yes. not legal. Uh, and real quick, dogs are used to break up a flock. So you you got a trained dog that will, you know, you say, okay, go, let them out of the camouflage sack, and they'll run around behind a flock, you know, a fall thirty plus bird flock, and break them up, and then they go scatter in all different directions. So then that's when you can apply that key key call, kind of go set up in like what would be the, the hub of where they busted yeah. and just call them back and you are the dominant hen saying okay safe come back so you wait 10 minutes 15 minutes and then bring them back so that's what the dog is for is to break that flock which keeps you from embarrassing yourself running across an open field screaming like a little girl trying to send turkeys in all different directions usually they all go that way can a dog ever get one not legally Anybody else? All right, well, we have your captivated attention here. We'll go to personal club, the National Law Church Federation. Our volunteers do a tremendous amount of work and fundraising. We partner with the uh, New Hampshire Fishing Game a lot, and it's only through the dollars we raise and the volunteer hours that are committed uh, in partnership with NOTF that we're able to have flock sizes we do in New Hampshire and the opportunity to go out and hunt. And the uh, contributions our organization makes beyond turkey hunting. So the projects we do are not just turkey specific. A lot of your uh, big fur critters, your non-game species are directly affected and, and benefited from the work our volunteers do. So if you are a turkey hunter, uh, become a member. It, you, you need, you should, and you need to be uh, a member of the Turkey Federation. That's what I say, and I don't say that to be insulting. It's just kind of having more skin in the game and being involved. Your license only does so much, but it doesn't do enough. Um, and if maybe Turkey Federation isn't for you, get involved with another nonprofit conservation organization and have more skin in the game. Uh, because we are a, a big minority in, in the country and, and we're fighting battles every day, and the more members we have, the bigger numbers, the bigger voice we have uh, at Capitol Hill and, and you know in Concord as well. Uh, we have a, a banquet coming up. Uh, April 28th in Concord at Fast Pro Shop starts at 3 o'clock. So after you take your uh, kids or grandkids out and you have a good turkey hunt, come on over and have a nice meal and help us uh, do some fundraising. 89 cents on every dollar raised goes right back into mission delivery. No one else can say that in our, uh, our area. So. 
Thank you all. Well, we thank you very much for, for sitting here and taking it all in. Thank you.